Hey guys, my name's Sam and welcome to Prep Medic. This week's video, we are going through a list of acronyms that we use in emergency medical services, what they are, what they mean, and when to use them. So this video, I've got a list of the common acronyms that are used in emergency medical services. I'm pretty convinced that the only people that like acronyms more than EMS is probably the military. Now, this video will be helpful for people going into EMT school, maybe paramedic school, although a lot of these you should already know. And then I'm hoping that because mo most of these acronyms are used in the assessment phase of care, somebody that likes to be uh, prepared, has a good grasp on first aid, could utilize these to gather some information before EMS arrives because they know it's already going to be asked. So without further ado, let's get into the video. So uh, I'm going to go through the main acronyms and then at the end there's like st stupid acronyms that we're just going to go through really, really quickly um, for people that might not know. A lot of them are just like classes and certifications. Jumping into it, BSI, body substance isolation. This is your goggles, your mask. This is anything that keeps the patient's bodily fluids off of you and vice versa. Next up, we're going into some of our assessment acronyms. And the first one on the list is AVPU. So AVPU stands for alert, verbal, pain, unresponsive. And this is a quick way of qualifying somebody's level of consciousness. So if they're alert, I walk up to them, they acknowledge me, they look at me, they know I'm there. Now, if they're alert to verbal, it means that they're like laying on the ground, they might have their eyes closed. And when I talk to them, hey, sir, what's going on? They look at me, they can respond to me. Now, it might not be like completely coherently, but they will wake up and respond to it. Then we have painful. So if I talk to them, nothing happens. I come up and do a sternal rub, pinch their earlobe, pinch their trap, something that is a painful stimulus. If they get up, they look at me, they can interact in any way, shape, or form that's alert to painful. And then finally is unresponsive. So they don't acknowledge me when I come up. They don't uh, talk back to me or respond when I talk to them. And then I do a painful stimuli and nothing happens. They're unresponsive. The next acronym is A and O times four. So we've established that the patient is alert. Now we have to figure out how oriented they are. So this stands for alert and oriented times person, place, time, and event times four. So in this case, what we're going to ask them is, hey, do you know who you are? Can they tell us their name? Uh, where are you? What time of day it is? Is it? And then what happened? If they can answer all of those, we're going to say ANO4. If they can answer three of those, ANO3, and all the way down to zero. So that's a really quick way of assessing mental status. Now, the next acronym in there is Glasgow Coma Scale. So that's GCS. And that's a little bit of a more in-depth mental mental medical assessment, and I'm not going to go into that on this video, maybe something down in the future. All right, so continuing the theme of assessment on our patients, the next one on the list is the sample history. Now, nursing, physicians, uh, EMS, all have a variation of the sample history, but sample is what's used uh, for EMS, uh, EMT basics in particular. So sample stands for signs and symptoms. So this is going to be kind of to somebody, hey, what are you feeling? So what are they feeling is a symptom and what do you see? Hey, they've got a branch sticking out of their leg. We're gonna go with allergies next, so that's the A. And that's, are you allergic to any medications or is there an environmental allergy that's pertinent here? Medications, do you take any medications on a daily basis? Next up, we've got past medical history. Now it's amazing how many people will deny past medical history and they take medications. So it's good that both of these questions are asked in tandem. Uh, you've got last oral intake, when was the last time you had anything to eat? And then finally, events leading up to the illness or injury. So that's your basic medical assessment for a patient. Those are the basic questions you ask. Obviously, once you go through that and you want to go a little bit more in depth on certain points, you can, but that gives you a general overview of their medical uh, history. Now, Next in line, we have OPQRST, and this is to specifically assess pain and to assess difficulty breathing. It really isn't valid for a whole lot of other complaints. And this one stands for onset, uh, provocation, quality, radiation, severity, time. And these have some very specific questions that go around them. So the classic uh, thing we're going to use OPQRST for is going to be your chest pain. And that's where this really shines as an assessment tool. So first and foremost, you have onset. Now onset is not time of onset necessarily. This is what were you doing when it started? Uh, hey, I just woke up with this chest pain. That's a 
pretty big sign of a potential cardiac issue. Provocation, does anything make that pain better or worse? Hey, no, it stays the same. It gets worse when I walk. Uh, it hurts when I do this. Anything like that. Uh, that's what we're looking for. Quality, how would you describe that? Hey, it's an elephant sitting on my chest. It feels like I'm being stabbed with a knife. Uh, radiation, does it go anywhere or does it stay in one place? Yeah, it goes down into my arm, up into my jaw. Uh, severity, scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the worst pain you've ever felt, 0 being no pain at all. How would you rate this pain? Or you could insert difficulty breathing if that's the issue. Now, it's important to note that that is a completely subjective assessment finding. So in that case, the only thing that's good for is trending it over time. So I want to ask them, hey, is it getting worse or is it getting better? throughout the transport. And it's a really easy way to kind of quantify that in my report uh, after the fact. And then finally, time. So this is what time did it start? And then has it come and gone since then? Or is it something that's pretty steady? Some instructors will tell you some different questions for OPQRST. So don't get all up in arms if your EMS instructor tells you something that's slightly different from what I just said. Next in the lineup is PEARL. And PEARL is a mnemonic to remember and to document normal pupillary responses. So pupils equal and round reactive to light. Uh, if all of those things are normal, then you document PEARL. If something is off, then you document the specific findings that you had on that patient's pupillary responses. Do that with a pen light in both eyes looking for those reactions. Next up, we have CMS or PMS. They mean the same thing, but they're kind of ordered differently. If you have an instructor that's still saying PMS, have them move over to the CMS. That's kind of the new way of saying this acronym so you're not instantly offending your female patient on the ambulance. Now, CMS stands for Circulation Motion Sensation, where PMS stands for Pulse Motor Sensory. Essentially, this is a way of assessing your feeling and your movement and your circulation distal, so that's farther down from an injury site. So if you just splinted somebody's arm, you want to make sure you didn't make that any worse or cut off blood supply. You're going to check their finger. You can check for a quick blanching of the fingernail, and that should come back in about two seconds in normal uh, ambient temperature. You see, make sure they can move it and make sure they can feel it. You can also check a pulse. So that's your circulation motion sensation. It's very important to check regularly, especially when they have extremity injuries. All right, moving down the list slowly but surely. I don't like this one, but it's still taught in a lot of uh, EMS schools. Really, I don't like it because it's not a useful acronym. This is for what you are looking for on a uh, full body assessment for somebody that's injured. So this, stand, this is DCAP BTLS. So DCAP BTLS stands for deformities, contusions, abrasions, penetrations, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. There's a ton of variations on this. The reason I don't like it is because essentially when you're doing a full body exam, you're looking for any kind of injury and it could be any one of those plus whatever else is out there. So I don't think this is the most important to memorize, but you probably will get tested on it at some point in your EMS career. Moving down the list, we have sludge. So sludge is signs and symptoms of a cholinergic toxidrome. This stands for salivation, lacrimation, urination, defecation, gastrointestinal distress, and emesis. And I don't really remember this acronym very well. What I do know is that in a cholinergic toxidrome, they're going to be leaking through every single pore in their body and orifice. And next up, AEIOU tips. This is underutilized. I think this is a great one to remember. These are some of your differential diagnoses for altered mental status. And this stands for alcohol, epilepsy, infection, opiates, uremia, trauma, insulin, poisoning, stroke. So this is a great one to remember. Um, it's also probably not something you're going to be tested on in your EMS career. It's a little bit less common. Now, somebody's going to be saying like, oh, Sam, you're reading this off a of screen. Yes, I am. Because doing these in the moment in front of a camera, I am so prone to forget something. That's why I'm referencing the quick cheat sheet I made for this. And I will link all of these down below or I'll have like a little thing in the description if you want to take a look at these in a text format only. All right, next up, we've got STEMI. So STEMI is another word for a certain type of heart attack. Now, contrary to common belief, heart attack does not mean cardiac arrest. Heart attack means a blockage in one of your coronary arteries. It can lead to cardiac arrest. So STEMI stands for ST segment myocardial infarction. So on an EKG, you have a portion that's called the ST segment. And when that elevates on an EKG in two or more contiguous leads, you have what's called a STEMI, and this is indicative of a very bad block that could lead to death down the road. They need 
Uh, basically, they need a cath lab to fix that, and you need to go quickly to the hospital. The reason you have to know this as an EMS provider is because if you see a STEMI on an EKG or if you're a BLS provider and you see the monitor flashing STEMI, you probably have to notify the receiving facility, and that's called a STEMI alert. They get the cath lab mobilized, call in who they need to call in, and it really decreases the time to the patient's treatment. All right, now we have two other assessment ones. We've got A, B, C, D, E, and we have March E. Now, both of these are what's called your primary assessment, and these are looking for life threats. A, B, C, D, E is the traditional one taught to EMS providers, although it is slightly changing, and this stands for airway, breathing, circulation, disability, and exposure. Uh, so for this, if we go down, we see they have a patent airway. If we they don't have a patent airway, we're going to fix that then we're going to make sure they're breathing. If they're not breathing, we're going to breathe for them. Circulation in this case is going to be um, like CPR. It's going to be making sure that they don't have any uh, compromises in that aspect. Uh, we're also going to be looking at disability, which is essentially, hey, I've got a spinal injury. I can't move this arm. I can't move this leg. Or you've got massive injuries in those extremities. They can't do something that they normally could do. And lastly would be exposure. So we can simultaneously expose them, but we're also going to make sure we keep them warm and we're considering the environmental factors that could be playing in to this patient's condition. Now, March E, I like this a lot better. I have a whole video on the March algorithm uh, that you can go check out. This is kind of, it, it started in the military. It started in like tactical units for tactical assessments. And really this should just be used by everybody in my opinion now, because it addresses things in a little bit of different order, but still hits all your life threats. So this stands for massive hemorrhage. So this is you walk up to somebody and they're bleeding profusely, I'm not gonna check their airway right away. I'm gonna stop them from bleeding and we can get to their airway in a second because I can't put blood back in the body uh, unless we have blood products. Even so, I'd rather not waste them. So massive hemorrhage. So we're gonna do tourniquets, wound packing. Next up, we've got airway, should sound familiar. Respiration, so that's your breathing. Circulation, this is going to be like IVs, IOs, blood products, uh, pelvic binders, uh, things like that. Uh, extrication and exposure is the E. So we want to keep them warm, hypothermia kills and trauma. Uh, and then we also have to think about how we're getting them out of this situation. So that was kind of rapid fire. I'm going to make sure this text is all coming up on the screen throughout the video uh, so that you have something to reference visually. Now, a couple uh, like other acronyms that you might hear, these are like mainly classes certifications. They don't really matter, but they're things you're going to hear. So BLS, basic life support. This is going to be your EMTs, uh, EMT, advanced EMTs. Uh, you've got your ALS, advanced life support, paramedics. Um, then you have your CCT, critical care transport. Uh, you have your ACLS, Advanced Cardiac Life Support, PALS, Pediatric Advanced Life Support. Um, BLS will also refer to your basic uh, CPR certification. PHTLS, Pre-Hospital Trauma Life Support. ATLS, Advanced Trauma Life Support. This is an advanced trauma course usually taken by uh, nursing and physicians for the hospital setting. It doesn't apply super well to paramedics. All right. I think that's all of them. If you have any questions, leave them in the comments down below. If you can think of anything else that would be helpful for somebody going into EMS or trying to do a patient assessment, list them down there as well. And I will see you next week.